welcome to the Gentleman's Guide to Gaming. And in this video, we are going to be talking about David Lynch. Not the person. David Lynch, the person, I'm sure, is a perfectly fine individual. I've heard him be interviewed many times and provide various short, unhelpful answers. Uh, that's always entertaining. But no, this is not going to be a video about who David Lynch is, though I do wish him well. It is more going to be a video about how David Lynch influences me with Curseborn. Now, this isn't a universal influence. And when I say that, I mean every single author who worked on Curseborn brought their own chain of influences. When I spoke last week about how much Stephen King influenced me on my work on Curseborn, one of my co-authors said Stephen King didn't influence me at all. And that <laughs> that is absolutely fine. That's desirable. You don't want your game to feel exactly like an emulation of one particular author. And in my case, David Lynch is one of the inspirations for my Curseborn work, partly in the game, but partly for the games I run of games like Curseborn, and specifically some of the Curseborn games I have uh, ran recently. You see, what David Lynch movies and TV shows and, and his shorts, uh, um, David Lynch is more of a prolific writer-director of short movies than he is of feature-length films. I very much recommend checking out some of his short films, uh, of which there are many, many, many to look up. Uh, you should be able to find them all through his website. Uh, he deals a lot with crises of identity. And I see that as one of the principal elements of the Curseborn role-playing game. It's a game where you struggle with who you are. What is your true self? Are you a human or are you a monster? Are you a member of your lineage or are you a member of your family? Are you your role, as in your profession, your calling, your class, or... Are you something very much different? Are you blessed or are you cursed? Who am I today? A movie, a TV movie, I don't think the original was a TV movie, but the sequel certainly was, that I've spoken a lot about in the world of horror, which isn't David Lynch, is The Stepfather. I've often cited it as one of my major horror inspirations. I think I wax on about it and They Came From Camp Myrtle Lake because I think The Stepfather, for one, Terry O'Quinn, the lead in it, is just superb. Uh, I saw Law By Night recently posted about The Stepfather as well. And... Uh, for me, it is just one of those excellent suspense-filled horror movies because your protagonist is changing faces throughout the movie. Not physically, uh, but he's changing his ID. David Lynch movies uh, deal with that kind of thing a lot. And I say movies. David Lynch media deals with that kind of thing a lot, whether we're looking at Twin Peaks, whether we're looking at Lost Highway, Inland Empire, Mulholland Drive... Uh, there is a lot going on about the question of who am I? And I was first introduced to David Lynch probably through The Elephant Man. I think I saw The Elephant Man at far too young an age. I was, well, the, like when most of us are first introduced to media that really influences us, it's often when we are far too young to really appreciate it at a critical level, but are blown away from it at an emotional level. It's why we end up getting nightmares when we see a horror movie. It's why we might cry when we first watch Bambi uh, and, and so forth. And I remember watching The Elephant Man when I was probably seven or eight years old because my parents watched it and they thought it was great. And... I remember just being utterly struck by what a beautiful, tragic film it was, what a terrible story it was, how you couldn't even see the person for his deformity. Uh, Merrick, the elephant man in question, you, you couldn't tell who he was and he couldn't express who he was because he was assumed to be a certain thing based on his appearance. And while The Elephant Man is, I guess, the most stark version of that in a David Lynch piece of media, 
Uh, if you were to look at a movie like Mulholland Drive as an example, which is a twisting, turning mystery of a character being one person, then being another person, discovering that their previous person is in fact deceased, you play with things like chronology, you play with the idea of uh, characters recognising you as someone else. You see this in other media as well, of course. American Psycho is fairly well known for it, but that is uh, coming at it from a different angle. It's more, I guess, you are a shapeless character. You are featureless. You are so much like everyone else that you might as well be someone else. In David Lynch, it's almost like a dichotomy of personalities. Uh, one of you is the risk taker, one of you is the safe pair of hands. As, a, as an example, Twin Peaks explores it very well as well, of course. Uh, the idea of Cooper, especially in Twin Peaks The Return, uh, being split across three different personalities. And... They're, or each of those personalities taking on a different physical form. They're effectively avatars of Cooper uh, in his best and worst states. So, anyhow... Why does this relate to Curseborn? How does it relate to Curseborn? Well, as I said, I think Curseborn is a massive game of identity crises. Uh, it can be, at least. If you want to really explore that personal horror aspect, that idea of questioning, especially when you look at a lineage like the Outcasts, uh, who am I today? Am I the mask I wear, or am I the monster within? is a really fun and tragic part of horror to explore. To take our outcasts as an example, they are not human. They may have been raised as human, they may have been taught that they were human in their first uh, formative years, but then at some point the mask falls off, the face falls off, and they realise that they have always been descended from something far more otherworldly than human. And I really jive with that idea. It's something we at Onyx Path have explored, of course, in other games, like Changing the Lost, there's an element of that. Demon the Descent, there's an element of that. But I think Curseborn really gets that down well, and it provides an excellent motivation for why your characters, who are all going through the same crises, would work together. What do you do when you first discover that life is not as it seems? Well, you will probably gravitate to other people who are suffering like you, because who else is going to understand you? Who else is going to accept you for what you are? Uh, in the Stephen King video that I made, I basically t transformed the plot of It into a chronicle of Curseborn. And I think you can you can do that. I was about to say easily do that. You can't easily do that with some David Lynch media. I would struggle to turn Eraserhead into, or hell, Dune, into a uh, game of Curseborn. But those real artistic movies like Mulholland Drive, like Inland Empire for that matter, Lost Highway, even to an extent Wild at Heart, you could transpose elements of those movies, and definitely Twin Peaks, most certainly Twin Peaks for a reason I'll get on to, into your games of Curseborn with absolute ease. Because something Lynch does incredibly well is he creates a sense of the uncanny, that despite the fact everything is weird for you, it is normal for everyone else. That when someone is conveying information to you that might be startling or unsettling, it is, for the person delivering it, totally normal. And that element of a, a character, let's say an, an elder primal, explaining completely blank-facedly to this person who has just discovered that they are accursed, this is how life is now, this is what you are going to have to temper, and if you do need to let that fury out occasionally, here's where you're going to direct it, clap on the shoulder, have fun with that bucko, and go heads off, is quite Lynchian in the way that the strange is, uh, is presented as utterly canny. And when I'm looking at those movies that I mentioned, I think you can very easily take a plot like something, let's, let's go for Lost Highway. Lost Highway deals with a character who, at the start of the movie, hears uh, someone he has never heard of is dead. Uh, Dick Laurent is dead, as I remember it. 
and he hears it over his intercom. There's no one there. And he ends up having various vivid dreams of his wife, his partner, uh, looking like a very pale-faced, bald man. And it's not me. And he keeps having these visions. He then goes to a party where he encounters the pale-faced man, the stranger, and this person says, you know, um, I'm at your house right now. Um, you, you've got to watch the scene to really appreciate it. But anyway, uh, and he says, you know, I'll prove it. Call your house right now. And he calls his house, the main character, and the pale-faced stranger answers the phone. And he's in two places at once. And in one, he's just looking and smiling. And in the other, he's on the phone with our character's wife. And the wife gets killed, and our protagonist ends up getting sent to death row. But then all of a sudden, partway through this very weird movie, there's a flash, and our main character turns into someone else. And the police release him, because, well, this isn't the person who's supposed to be on death row. We don't know where Fred has gone, but this guy is not him. And so our much younger character is released from jail and is basically picking his way through the remnants of the mystery of our previous character with some of the links, some of the knowledge of what our previous character was going through, but it's all very hazy. He sees a photograph of various characters that his previous self would have interacted with and basically suffers a nosebleed later on in the movie. He switches back anyway. All of that sounds very, very complicated. I promise it isn't. It's actually a really, really good movie. I recommend Lost Highway. I think it's one of the ones most people sleep on with Lynch. And this video isn't simply a synopsis of The Lost Highway. The reason I am delivering all of this information to you is because that uncanny feeling, that idea of your character wakes up and there's a piece of information that's delivered, Dick Laurent is dead. Who's Dick Laurent? Who left this message for me? Why do I recognise that voice? And you encounter a character who claims to be in two places at once. And they seem mildly threatening, but also offering to help you. And you find, partway through the story, that your own identity changes. That your perception of who you are and what you are capable of is different. And what's more, if you start getting a little Inland Empire, Mulholland Drive about it, Twin Peaks about it, you could then encounter a, essentially a doppelganger of yourself. Someone who is you, but better. Someone who is you, but without the baggage. And then you have to question, am I who I think I am? Or is that me and who I'm trying to be? Now, you might be thinking, how does that play into Curseborn? Well... The wonderful thing about the outside, our liminal spaces and the planes, the realms that are deep within it, is a lot of very strange things can happen. That party that our character attends in Lost Highway could well be a liminal space where uh, the uncanny starts to bleed through into reality. That voice that was left on your intercom or passed through the intercom or on your voicemail that said Dick Laurent is dead could have come from the future. It does not need to come from now. It could even come from you in the future, and that's why you recognise the voice, even as garbled as it is. Hell, it might come from a different version of you. Maybe a you before you were accursed, or you after, if you want to play a kind of transition game where you uh, pass through various states. Uh, this is also the kind of movie that can serve as a fantastic mystery plot. I mean, as an RPG, to make a Lynchian piece of media into a game, you do need to, I would suggest, make it a little more straightforward, because Lynch media is, by design, open to interpretation. There are no clear answers for why something is going on. I think that is something you can really play with very, very well in Curseborn. Don't always provide categorically clean answers to people's questions. Sometimes a mystery is a mystery, and that should be sufficient. I mentioned Twin Peaks and why it is such a perfect inspiration for Curseborn, and it is because everyone in the town of Twin Peaks has a secret. 
And what you see with the unfolding of Twin Peaks, including the much maligned second half of the second season, barring the last episode, is that as those secrets emerge, the entire town starts to break down. Uh, it isn't that everyone is at each other's throats. It isn't needful things to go back to our Stephen King's re <laughs> Stephen King reference. But what it is is showing that people with their curses ultimately succumbs their damnations and when they succumb to their damnations all hell can break loose and there are victims some of them innocent some of them guilty some of them are monsters and they don't even realize that they are monsters i'm not going to spoil anything twin peaks related because while it has been out for a very long time it is something i very much recommend people check out from the beginning without any perception of the content and, of course, Twin Peaks also has very famous dream sequences, which turn out may not be dream sequences, with the Red Room and the Black Lodge and so forth, uh, where various realities are unveiled to our protagonists. And what's more, with those kinds of places, yes, in a game of Curseborn, you can make those kinds of spaces into interstitial zones, but you can make them into dreams. You could have the Roadhouse, you could have the Double R Diner, you can have other elements of Twin Peaks as shattered spaces, especially the Roadhouse, which is a place where it seems violence inevitably breaks out whenever any anyone goes there. We have our Champagne Room in Curseborn, it was in the Ashcan, it's also in the Core Rulebook, which is kind of like the Roadhouse, except uh, I guess you could say more sexual than violent. <laughs> There's a sex that happens at the Roadhouse too. Um, I think that when you take in the breadth of David Lynch's work, and I strongly recommend people who are looking for some interpretive art, do so. Because the number of ideas I have been able to pluck from the works of Lynch and put them in my games, mainly Curseborn, but I've done it with others as well, World of Darkness, Chronicles of Darkness, is just such a well, such a font of knowledge of ideas. This is the best thing I can say about the works of David Lynch as informs me as a GM, a story guide, a writer. I can keep revisiting a movie like Inland Empire and every single time I watch it, as uncomfortable as viewing that movie may be, I can pull a new idea from it and I can twist that idea and I can present it in a different way. And one of the reasons for that is because Lynch doesn't provide answers necessarily. Instead, every single time I use that idea, I can present it differently. I can provide a different reason, a different conclusion, if indeed I want to provide a reason or conclusion. So, with that said, I think there's only one last thing to say, and that's mezzy dotes and dozy dotes and little lambsy divey, kiddly ivy too, wouldn't you? Oh, mezzy dotes and dozy dotes and little lambsy divey, a kiddly divey too, wouldn't you? Now, if my words sound queer and funny to your ear, a little bit jumbled and jivey. Say mezzy dotes and gozy dotes and little lambsy dive.